The traveller stood looking from the taproom window of the cauliflower at the falling rain. The village street below was empty and everything was quiet, with the exception of the garrulous old man smoking with much enjoyment on the settle behind him. It'll do a power of good, said the ancient, craning his neck round the edge of the settle and turning a bleared eye on the window. I ain't like some folk. I never did mind a drop of rain. The traveller grunted and, returning to the settle opposite the old man, fell to lazily stroking a cat, which had strolled in, attracted by the warmth of the small fire, which smouldered in the grate. He's a good mouser, said the old man, but I expect that Smith, the landlord, would sell him to anybody for half a crown. But we had a cat in Clayberry once that you couldn't have bought for a hundred golden sovereigns. The traveller continued to caress the cat. A white cat with one yellow eye and a one blue one continued the old man. It sounds queer, but it's as true as I sit here, wishing that I had another mug of ale as good as the last you gave me. The traveller, with a start that upset the cat's nerves, finished his own mug and then ordered both to be refilled. He stirred the fire into a blaze and, lighting his pipe and putting one foot onto the hob, prepared to listen. He used to belong to old man Clark, young Joe Clark's uncle, said the ancient, smacking his lips delicately over the ale and extending a tremulous claw to the tobacco pouch pushed towards him. And he was never tired of showing it off to people. He used to call it his blue-eyed darling. And the fuss he made of that cat was sinful. Young Joe Clark couldn't bear it. But being down in his uncle's will for five cottages and a bit of land, bringing in about 40 pounds a year, he had to hide his feelings and pretend as he loved it. He used to take it little drops of cream and tip bits of meat. An old Clark was so pleased that he promised him that he should have the cat along with all the other property when he was dead. Young Joe said he couldn't thank him enough, and the old man, who'd been ailing a long time, made him come up every day to teach him how to take care of it after he was gone. He taught Joe how to cook its meat, and then chop it up fine. I liked a clean saucer every time for its milk, and I wasn't to make a noise when it was asleep. Take care your children don't worry it, Joe. He says one day, very sharp, one of your boys was pulling its tail this morning, and I want you to clump his head for him. Which one was it? Says Joe. The slobbery-nosed one, says old Clark. I'll give him a clap as soon as I get home, says Joe, who was very fond of his children. Go and fetch him and do it here, says the old man. They'll teach him to love animals. Joe went off home to fetch the boy, and after his mother had washed his face and wiped his nose, and put a clean penny for on him. He took him to his uncle's and clouted his head for him. Like that, Joe and his wife had words all night long, and next morning, old Clark, coming in from the garden, was just in time to see him kick the cat right across the kitchen. He could hardly speak for a minute, and when he could, Joe see plain what a fool he'd been. First of all, he called Joe every name he could think of, which took him a long time. And then he ordered him out of his ass. <laughs> <laughs>
You shall have my money when your betters have done with it, he says, and not a four. That's all you've done for yourself. Joe Clark didn't know what he meant at the time, but when old Clark died three months afterwards, he found out his uncle had made a new will and left everything to old George Barstow for as long as the cat lived, providing that he took care of it. When the cat was dead, the property was to go to Joe. The cat was only two years old at the time, and George Barstow, who was half crazy with joy, said it shouldn't be his fault if it didn't live another 20 years. The funny thing was, the quiet way Joe Clark took it, he didn't seem to be at all cut up about it. And when Henry Walker said it was a shame, he said he didn't mind, and that George Barstow was an old man, and he was quite welcome to have the property as long as the cat lived. He must come to me by the time I'm an old man, he says, and that's all I care about. Henry Walker went off, and as he passed the cottage where old Clark used to live, and which George Barstow had moved into. He spoke to the old man over the palings and told him what Joe Clark had said. George Barstow only grunted and went on stooping and prying over his front garden. Been a law something, says Henry Walker, watching him. Nah, I'm finding, says George Barstow, very fierce, and picking up something. That's the fifth bit of powder liver I've found in my garden this morning. Henry Walker went off whistling, and the opinion he'd had of Joe Clark began to improve. He spoke to Joe about it that afternoon, and Joe said, that if he ever accused him of such a thing again, he'd knock his head off. He said that he hoped the cat had lived to be a hundred, and that he'd no more think of giving it poisoned meat than Henry Walker would have paid for his drink so long as he could get anybody else to do it for him. They had bets up at this here cauliflower public house that evening, as to how long that cat had lived. Nobody gave it more than a month, and Bill Chambers sat and thought of so many ways of killing it on the sly that it was wonderful to hear him. George Barstow took fright when he heard of them, and the care he took of that cat was wonderful to behold. Half its time, it was shot up in the back bedroom, and the other half, George Barstow was fussing after it till that cat got to hate him like poison. Instead of giving up work, as he'd thought to do, he told Henry Walker that he'd never worked so hard in his life. What about fresh air and exercise for it? says Henry. What about Joe Clark? says George Barstow. I'm tied hand and foot. I dursn't leave the ass for a moment. I ain't been to the cauliflower since I've had it, and three times I got out of bed last night to see if it was safe. Mark my words, says Henry Walker. If that cat don't have exercise, you'll lose it. I shall lose it if it does have exercise, says George Barstow. That I know. He sat down, thinking after Henry Walker had gone. And then he had a little collar and chain made for it, and took it out for a walk. Pretty nearly every dog in Clayberry went with him, and a cat 
was in such a state of mind before they got home, they couldn't do anything with it. It had a fit as soon as they got indoors. And George Barstow, who had read about children's fits in the almanac, gave it a warm bath. He brought it round immediate, and then he began to tear round the room and up and down stairs, till George Barstow was afraid to go near it. It was so bad that evening, sneezing, that George Barstow sent for Bill Chambers, who'd got a good name for doctoring animals, and asked him to give it something. Bill said he got some padders at home that would cure it at once, and he went and fetched them and mixed one up with a bit of butter. That's the way to give a cat medicine, he says. Smear it with the butter, and then it'll lick it off, a powder and all. He was just going to rub it on the cat when George Barstow caught hold of his arm and stopped him. How do I know it ain't poison, he says. You're a friend of Joe Clark's, and for all I know, he may have paid you to poison it. I wouldn't do such a thing, says Bill. You ought to know me better than that. All right, says George Barstow. You eat it then, and I'll give you two shillings instead of one. You can easy mix some more. Not me, says Bill Chambers, making a face. Well, three shillings then, says George Barstow getting more and more suspicious-like. Four shillings, five shillings. Bill Chambers shook his head, and George Barstow, more and more certain that he had caught him trying to kill his cat and that he wouldn't eat the stuff, rose him up to ten shillings. Bill looked at the butter, and then he looked at the ten shillings on the table, and at last he shut his eyes and gulped it down and put the money in his pocket. You see, I have to be careful, Bill, says George Barstow, rather upset. Bill Chambers didn't answer him. He sat there as white as a sheet and making such extraordinary faces. But George was half afraid of him. Anything wrong, Bill? He says at last. Bill sat staring at him. And then all of a sudden, he clapped his handkerchief to his mouth. And getting up from his chair, opened the door and rushed out. And George Barstow thought of fust that he had eaten poison for the sake of the ten shillings. But when he remembered that Bill Chambers had got the most delicate stomach in Claybury, he altered his mind. The cat was better next morning, but George Barstow had had such a fright about it, he wouldn't let it go out of his sight. And Joe Clark began to think that he would have to wait longer for that property than he had thought after all. To hear him talk, anybody that thought that he loved that cat. We didn't pay much attention to it up at the cauliflower here, except maybe to wink at him, a thing he couldn't abear. But at home, of course, his young'uns thought as everything he said was gospel. And one day, coming home from work, as he was passing George Barstow's, he was paid out for his deceitfulness. I've wronged you, Joe Clark, says George Barstow, coming to the door, and I'm sorry for it. Oh, says Joe, staring. Give that to your little Jimmy, says George Barstow, giving him a shilling. I've given him one, but I thought afterwards it wasn't enough. But what for, says Joe, staring at him again, for bringing my cat home. 
says George Barstow. How he got out, I can't think, but I lost it for three hours. And I'd about given it up when your little Jimmy brought it to me in his arms. He's a fine little chap, and he does you credit. Joe Clark tried to speak, but he couldn't get a word out. And Henry Walker, what had just come up and heard what passed, took hold of his arm and helped him home. He walked like a man in a dream, but halfway he stopped and cut a stick from the edge to take home to little Jimmy. He said the boy had been asking him for a stick for some time, but up till then he'd always forgotten it. At the end of the first year, that cat was still alive, to everybody's surprise. But George Barstow took such care of it, he never let it out of his sight. Every time he went out, he took it with him in a hamper. And, to prevent it being poisoned, he paid Isaac Sawyer, who had the biggest family in Claybury, sixpence a week to let one of his boys taste its milk before it had it. The second year, it was ill twice, but the horse doctor that George Barstow got for it said that it was as hard as nails, and with care it might live to be twenty. He said that he wanted more fresh air and exercise, but when he heard how George Barstow come by it, he said that perhaps it would live longer indoors after all. At last one day, when George Barstow had been living on the fat of the land for nearly three years, that cat got out again. George had raised the front room window two or three inches to throw something outside, and before he knew what was happening, the cat was outside and going up the road about 20 miles an hour. George Barstow went after it, but he might as well have tried to catch the wind. The cat was half wild with joy at getting out again, and he couldn't get within half a mile of it. He stayed out all day without food or drink, following it about until it came on dark. And then, of course, me lost sight of it, and hoping against hope, that it would come home for its food. He went home and waited for it. He sat up all night, dozing in a chair, in the front room with the door left open. But it was all no use. And after thinking for a long time what was best to do, he went out and told some of the folks it was lost and offered a reward of five pounds for it. You never saw such a hunt then in all your life. Nearly every man, woman and child in Claybury left their work or school and went to try and earn that five pounds. By the afternoon, George Barstow made it ten pounds, provided the cat was brought home safe and sound, and people as was too old to walk stood at their cottage doors to snap it up as it came by. Joe Clark was hunting for it high and low, and so was his wife and the boys. In fact, I believe that everybody in Claybury, excepting the parson and Bob Pretty, was trying to get that ten pounds. Of course, we could understand the parson. His pride wouldn't let him. But a low, poaching, thieving rascal like Bob Pree turning up his nose at ten pounds was more than we could make out. Even on the second day, when George Barstow made it ten pounds down and a shilling a week for a year besides, he didn't offer to stir. All he did was to try and make fun of them as was looking for it. Have you looked everywhere you can think of for it, Bill? 
He says to Bill Chambers, Yes, I have, says Bill. Well then, you want to look everywhere else, says Bob Pretty. I know where I should look if I wanted to find it. Why don't you find it then, says Bill. Because I don't want to make mischief, says Bob Pretty. I don't want to be unable to Joe Clark by interfering at all. Not for all that money, says Bill. Not for fifty pounds, says Bob Pretty. You ought to know me better than that, Bill Chambers. It's my belief that you know more about where that cat is than you ought to, says Joe Gubbins. You go on looking for it, Joe, says Bob Pretty, grinning. It's good exercise for you, and you've only lost two days' work. I'll give you half a crown if you let me search your ass, Bob says Bill Chambers, looking at him very hard. I couldn't do it at the price, Bill, says Bob Pre, shaking his head. I'm a poor man, but I'm very particular who I have come into my ass. Of course, everybody left off looking at once when they heard about Bob. Not that they believed that he'd be such a fool as to keep the cat in his ass. And that evening, as soon as it was dark, Joe Clark went round to see him. Don't tell me as that cat's found, Joe, says Bob Pre, as Joe opened the door. Not as I've heard of, said Joe, stepping inside. I wanted to speak to you about it. The sooner it's found, the better I shall be pleased. It does your credit, Joe Clark, says Bob Pre. It's my belief that it's dead, says Joe, looking at him very hard. But I want to make sure of for taking over the property. Bob Pretty looked at him, and then he gave a little cough. Ah, you want it to be found dead, he says. Now I wonder whether that cat's worth most dead or alive. Joe Clark coughed then. Dead, I should think he says at last. George Barstow's just had bills printed offering fifteen pounds for it, says Bob Pretty. I'll give that or more when I come into the property, says Joe Clark. There's nothing like ready money though, is there? Says Bob. I'll promise it to you in writing, Bob, says Joe, trembling. There's some things that don't look well in writing, Joe, says Bob Pretty, considering. Besides, why should you promise it to me? Of course, I meant if you found it, says Joe. Well, I'll do my best, Joe, says Bob Pretty, and none of us can do no more than that, can they? They sat talking and arguing over it for over an hour. And twice, Bob Pretty got up and said he was going to see whether George Barstow wouldn't offer more. By the time they parted, they was as thick as thieves. And next morning, Bob Pretty was wearing Joe Clark's watch and chain. And Mrs. Pretty was up at Joe's ass to see whether there was any of his furniture as she had a fancy for she didn't seem to be able to make up her mind at first between a chest of drawers that had belonged to Joe's mother and a grandfather clock. She walked from one to the other for about ten minutes and then Bob, who had come in to help her, told her to have both. You're quite welcome, he says. Ain't she, Joe? Joe Clark said yes, and Arthur, he had helped them carry him home. The pretties went back and took the best bedstead to pieces, because Bob said as it was easier to carry that way. And Mrs. Clark had to go and sit down at the bottom of the garden with the neck of her dress undone to give herself air. But when she saw 
the little pretties, each walking home with one of her best chairs on their heads. She got a walked up and down like a mad thing. I'm sure I don't know where we're to put it all, says Bob Pretty to Joe Gobbins, who was looking on with other folks. But Joe Clark is that generous, he won't hear of our leaving anything. Has he gone mad? says Bill Chambers, staring at him. Not as I knows on, says Bob Pretty. It's his good heartedness, that's all. He feels sure that the cat's dead and that he'll have George Barstow's cottage and furniture. I told him he'd better wait till he'd made sure, but he wouldn't. Before they'd finished, the pretties had picked their ass as clean as a bone, and Joe Clark had to go and get clean straw for his wife and children to sleep on. Not that Mrs. Clark had any sleep that night, nor Joe neither. Henry Walker was the first to see what it really meant, and he went rushing off as fast as he could run to tell George Barstow. George couldn't believe him at first, but when he did, he swore that if a heir of that cat's head was armed, he'd have the law on Bob Pretty. And after Henry Walker had gone, he walked round to tell him so. You're not yourself, George Barstow, else you wouldn't try and take away my character like that, says Bob Pretty. What did Joe Clark give you all them things for? Says George, pointing to the furniture. Took a fancy to me, I suppose, says Bob. People do sometimes. There's something about me at times that makes them like me. He gave them to you to kill my cat, says George Barstow. It's plain enough for anybody to see. Bob Pretty smiled. I expect it will turn up safe and sound one of these days, he says. And then you'll come round and beg my pardon. Perhaps. Perhaps what, says George Barstow, are awaiting a bit. Perhaps somebody has got it and is keeping it till you've drawn the 15 pounds out of the bank, says Bob, looking at him very hard. I've taken it out of the bank, says George, starting. If that cat's alive, Bob, and you've got it, there's the 15 pounds the moment you hand it over. What do you mean, me got it, says Bob Pre. You be careful of my character. I mean, if you know where it is, says George Barstow, trembling all over. I don't say I couldn't find it. If that's what you mean, says Bob, I can generally find things when I want to. You find me that cat alive and well and the money's yours, Bob, says George, hardly able to speak now that he fancied their cat was still alive. Bob Pre shook his head. Nah, but that won't do, he says. Suppose I did have the luck to find that poor animal, You'd say I'd had it all the time and refused to pay. I swear I wouldn't, Bob, says George Barstow, jumping up. Best thing you can do if you want me to try and find that cat, says Bob Pree, is to give me the 15 pounds now and I'll go and look for it at once. I can't trust you, George Barstow. And I can't trust you, says George Barstow. Very good, says Bob, getting up. There's no harm done. Perhaps Joe Clark will find the cat is dead. And perhaps you'll find it's alive. It's all one to me. George Barstow walked off home. But he was in such a state of mind, he didn't know what to do. Bob Pretty, turning up his nose at 15 pounds like that, made him think that Joe Clark had promised to pay him more if their cat was dead. And at last, I worried about it for a couple of hours, he came up to this here cauliflower 
and offered Bob the fifteen pounds. What's this for? says Bob. For finding my cat, says George. Look here, says Bob, handing it back. I've had enough of your insults. I don't know where your cat is. I mean, for trying to find it, Bob, says George Barster. Oh, well, I don't mind that, says Bob, taking it. I'm a hard-working man, and I've got to be paid for my time. It's only fair to my wife and children. I'll start now. He finished up his beer, and while the other chaps was telling George Barstow what a fool he was, Joe Clark slipped out of Bob Pree and began to call him all the names he could think of. Don't you worry, says Bob. The cat ain't found yet. Is it dead? says Joe Clark, hardly able to speak. How should I know? says Bob. That's what I got to try and find out. That's what you gave me your furniture for, and what George Barstow gave me the 15 pounds for, ain't it? Now don't you stop me now, cause I'm going to begin looking. He started looking there and then, and for the next two or three days, George Barstow and Joe Clark see him walking up and down with his hands in his pockets, looking over garden fences and calling, Puss! He asked everybody he see whether they had seen a white cat with one blue eye and one yellow one. And every time he came into the cauliflower, he put his head over the bar and called, Puss! Because as he said, it was as likely to be there as anywhere else. It was about a week after the cat had disappeared that George Barstow was standing at his door talking to Joe Clark, who was saying the cat must be dead and he wanted his property. When he sees a man coming up the road and carrying a basket, stop and speak to Bill Chambers. Just as he got near them, an awful meow come from the basket, and George Barstow and Joe Clark started as if they'd been shot. He's found it, shouts Bill Chambers, pointing to the man. It's been living with me over at Ling for a week, pretty nearly, says the man. I tried to drive it away several times, not knowing that there was 15 pounds offered for it. George Barstow tried to take hold of the basket. I want that 15 pounds first, says the man. That's only right and fair, George, says Bob Pree, who had just come up. You got all the luck, mate. We've been on high and low for that cat for a week. Then George Barstow tried to explain to the man and call Bob Pree names at the same time, but it was all no good. The man said it had nothing to do with him, what he had paid to Bob Pree. And at last, they fetched Policeman White over from Cudford, and George Barstow signed a paper to pay five shillings a week till the reward was paid. George Barstow had the cap for five years out of that, but he never let it get away again. They got to like each other in time and died within a fortnight of each other, so that Joe Clark got his property all.